<laughs> Hi, today we're going to anchor and that's why I check up the anchor place first at my different types of charts and books. One is my um, uh, favorite NV charts from Germany. They even have anchor symbols where you can anchor where it is recommended. And a guidebook uh, like where we are sailing right now around Gibraltar, the Atlantic, Spain and Portugal one, is also very helpful to give some advice on where to anchor and uh, where it is feasible. The Reads also has some information available and maybe the Reads is most up to date because it has um, it is printed annually. Uh, the charts are maybe not so updated they should be and the book is printed every four years or something. My actually biggest favorite to choose an anchorage these days is the app on my phone or iPad. It's called Navili and there you can find a lot of anchorages and harbors and also what other people think about it. And the best um, feature is that it gives advice according to the weather. You press on the app and you can zoom in onto your position. And the thing is that anchorages and marinas are shown likewise. So uh, marinas are these little uh, blue and white dots and the anchorages are in different colors depending on how feasible they are due to the weather or reviews. So we want to pick this anchorage there. So we can press that, it's called La Linea, and you have some nice pictures. You can watch if you would like to see what people have put on there uh, as different pictures that the anchorage is authorized. And then the coolest feature is the shelter you have here. And the shelter is here from northwest to south over the east and the current wind and swell in knots and uh, meters. So that's why we have a green anchor here. It's 96% recommended, however they have figured that out at this time. And you can see it remains green and how the um, weather changes there over time. Now it becomes a little bit less feasible but still very good. And down here it is on Wednesday at 6 o'clock it only becomes 23% uh, feasible because wind and swell then comes from west and southwest where you don't have any um, shelter. So right now if we go back to uh, the weather we have now this weather feature by the way is only available because I have paid a little bit extra 19 euros I think per uh, year to support them and also to uh, get this weather information over a further um, period of time. So it's very green where we want to anchor. So that's cool. And down here we have all the reviews, all the stars, what the different people have said. Now when it comes to anchoring, uh, you really have to look out for your uh, anchor equipment as well, of course. So the anchor itself is very important because many people are a bit afraid of anchoring. Um, they don't sleep well. They think that you have to, to have uh, a, a watch system. But I sleep very well because I think it, I have a very good anchor equipment. There are still very old boats around there which still use the 1938 invented CQR anchor, which used to be the only anchor available actually. And very many production boats um, have the standard anchor, the Delta, which the boat was originally delivered with because it's rather cheap and inexpensive. Um, if you look around, uh, you can find different types of anchoring uh, equipment and it's almost a religion and a little bit tradition also. So uh, it started off with a lot of German sailors who love their bügelanker and that then eventually was evolved into the New Zealand Rockner anchor. And you can see Rockner anchors everywhere on serious boats which anchor and serious blue water cruisers. So uh, that is almost the biggest player um, around. French boats uh, seem to like the Spader. This is also very modern, which is uh, very feasible and has a very good reputation and you can actually take it apart. Uh, Swedish boats, on the other hand, they like to have a bruise and preferably uh, on, at the stern. The bruise is made for, uh, was originally invented in 71 for the oil platforms in the North Sea, where it's very soft mud. So it's very good for soft mud. And Swedish people, they like going uh, bow to to the islands uh, in the archipelago and then they have a stern anchor. And since it's very 
soft mud there a bruise is quite uh, good to have there to have it in the bow I don't know if it's the best anchor because as soon as it becomes very uh, hard bottom it doesn't dig in dig through um, the hard uh, sand for instance so well um, there you maybe want to have a little bit more needle-like anchor so to speak another good anchor is the Turkish stainless steel ultra anchor um, which comes in huge sizes for super yachts even it has a very good reputation albeit uh, quite expensive to buy because it has it is only uh, available in stainless steel and it is hollow in the shaft so if you are looking for a modern anchor I would look at Rockna, Spade and uh, Ultra and uh, as a uh, hurricane anchor I also have a Fortress. Fortress is an aluminium anchor which is very very strong if you uh, pull it in the uh, constant direction. So this tape is very easily taken apart, put into a bag and it's in my aft deck locker. So uh, that's what I have and we can go on deck and uh, see how it looks in reality before we cast off and then we do anchoring. Welcome on the foredeck of Regina Alaska. So here I will uh, show you my anchor equipment. I have a Lofron 1700 watt windlass uh, with a capstan and this means that I can um, by using a windlass or a winch handle up here I mean I can uh, disconnect the windlass the chain part and the capstan that means that I can use the capstan this top part individually for a second anchor or to hoist a person in the mast then I lead a, a halyard spare halyard to this winch or for mooring when my bow thruster isn't working or something um, or for man overboard so I like the availability to have the capstan as a spare windlass or a spare winch it is this is the windlass down here controlled with these two buttons but I have two extra buttons at the pedestal so I can um, control the up and down by the steering wheel as well some other people have remote controls in the hand so that's the windlass I have a, a 10 millimeter stainless steel chain now when it comes to chain and it's very important that it is strong enough because the it's not only as strong as the weakest link as they say and it's quite literally here uh, and uh, a, a galvanized uh, old-fashioned galvanized chain is actually stronger so um, in doubt I, I would advise a standard galvanized chain um, and you can re-galvanize it or you can buy a new one because they're not so expensive the disadvantage is of course rust and the big advantage of the stainless steel chain uh, of course don't rust but it also packs very smoothly so mine is from Kettenwelder so it has been test pulled from the manufacturer to make sure that it really holds 10,000 newtons so my length of my chain is 80 meters I've been thinking a lot about the length and um, the length of the chain is really an issue only uh, if you anchor in very deep waters so there are some deep waters around like in Turkey where you need long chains but if you have a, a ratio from one to five, um, then I mean 80 meters, that easily lets me anchor in, in 50 meters plus. Uh, so you want to save some weight as well. But some people have 100, some people have 60. So after the chain here, I have this chain locker because I actually destroyed my windlass last year uh, where the snubber broke and the whole weight of the chain um, or the, the boat actually was hanging on the windlass only. So that's why you need a snubber and I'll show you that when we are anchoring in a minute. Uh, you can even pull it here and then it goes um, off uh, completely. But when you then anchor, you close it here. I have put a little elastics there and what happens now if the anchor would fall down I have the rope in the uh, in the bow that stops the anchor falling down but this would also stop it from falling down so this is taking the weight not the windlass uh, in emergency normally this is not going to be used because when you anchor you normally have a snubber which I will show in a minute and now let's continue the chain upwards to the front here we have the swivel so there are a lot of types of swivels and many of them are um, actually only con made for moving in one direction so you really want to have a multi-directional uh, swivel so it can turn freely what you can have of course is just a um, 
a, a shackle that's just as fine but it doesn't turn when you are choosing a shackle be careful so the shackle is not weaker than the chain because stainless steel shackles are not very strong so even if you have a stainless steel chain and you desperately want to have a um, uh, shackle I would almost go for a galvanized a huge galvanized shackle but I like the swivel not only because it um, it helps the boat turn in when you anchor in tidal waters because every six hours the boat turns into a new direction but also it turns the anchor into position when pulling it up this is an ultra swivel it is actually stronger than the chain and it has a ball inside here so it can freely move in all directions so this is also stainless steel because of everything from ultra stainless steel and it's um, intended to go onto an ultra an uh, anchor but I use it for my Rockner uh, here and you can see that this is for cost reasons actually I have chosen to have it in galvanized um, because they're quite expensive if you buy them in stainless steel but they do also come in stainless steel the Rockner 40 kilos is maybe overkill for my 20 tons um, uh, Regina Alaska Halbeck Rossi 46 uh, before I had a, a Rockner 33 kilo on this boat that was really good enough uh, but for the sake of sleeping well I think it's more important to have a heavy good anchor than any heavy or long uh, chain I've had so many anchors on my boats uh, I'm very very pleased with Rockner uh, the the weight of 40 of course helps it even better to dig into uh, through seagrass uh, and weed and so on so now let's go even f uh, more forward and see how I secure the anchor and uh, how I use the pin to avoid that the chain jumps over the bow roller if I anchor in heavy seas so this line is here to prevent the anchor from falling down in case the anchor winch doesn't work or if it slips so it stops the anchor from uh, falling down the alternative would be to have a pin through there and I actually have a pin also for another reason so I secure the pin here on the side so I don't drop it overboard with a little line so I have two holes and it can go through the anchor and it holds the anchor in place now um, this is has the disadvantage that you really have to find all three holes in the correct position so it goes through it also has another very big disadvantage because the Rockner anchor here has a huge surface which is the whole idea when uh, it is to be holding the whole boat in the in the mud or in the sand so these huge surfaces can also work against you that when the wave the big wave pushes the anchor upwards it can actually bend this pin uh, here and then you can't pull it out anymore so for safety reasons I actually prefer uh, the rope having said that once the rope is away and the chain runs over the uh, anchor bow roller when you're anchored you sometimes need to set the pin here uh, while the anchor is down in the uh, buried in the sand and that is because if it's heavy swell the bow of my boat could go up and down and up and down and the chain could actually jump over here and come on the side and that's something you really want to avoid when anchoring in heavy swell so first of all I'll switch on the bottom discrimination sounder that is a really cool thing I'll switch it on here at the navigation table um, in order to check what type of bottom we have if it is sand stone gravel or mud after having switched on the bottom discrimination sounder downstairs I now have the data available on the plotter and on the time zero PC software downstairs so we pull down the plotter here and then I have prepared one screen here which I can click with the bottom discrimination sounder to the left in red and the plotter to the right so let's find some nice um, sandy pitch here where the others are uh, anchoring so let's go there and find some sand we can check what the tide is doing because we need to make sure that we uh, anchor at the right depth right depth means not too shallow because then if the tide goes down we might hit the bottom but then again we have to consider how much is the tide going up now in Gibraltar the tide isn't that big but we can have a little check so I press with two uh, fingers here and then I get the tide for my nearest place and I can see we are at high water here do you see that so we have a high water 
call it one meter above chart datum. And the next one goes down to 0 0.18 meters. So that means, let's call it 0 0.2. Uh, so it goes down by 0 0.8 meters. Let's call it one meter. So actually, wherever we anchor now, we have to think of the fact that later during the night, the tide will take us down by one meter from, or 80 centimeters, from 0 0.95 to 0 0.18. Of course, you could do that by hand and using reeds, and I have great templates for that as well to um, figure out the, the how much the tide is going up and down for anchoring. But this is very easy to just use two fingers and you get the information right away. We are at high water. That means that when we anchor and let out the anchor, we, it won't go up anymore, meaning we don't have to take give some extra chain to take the bigger depth into consideration. So we're back to that picture. Well, still looking for sand. So um, let's go a bit on and uh, revert when we found some. Oh, hooray, we have sand. Look at that. Oh, it became stone again. Too bad. But the thing is that we can find that sand pitch again if we wanted to, that little sand pitch. And uh, look at here, if you look at the right, you can see the boat, we can zoom it in. And here is the little sand pitch just after the fish. So um, uh, there, we can sail back to that yellow part if we wanted to anchor there. But actually, we, we want to go a bit closer to shore uh, because it's still six meters deep here. Now we have found a really long patchy sand piece of sand here. Look, it's really sandy for a long time. And um, we, can, we can zoom in this and see from there to there sand. So we'll, we'll go back and uh, turn around. So here I'm, I'm at foredeck now, and now I'm going to prepare the anchoring. So I open up the box here. Now preparing everything, taking out my fast fender to give enough space for the anchor. I take out the snubber, which we will use in a second. And then we have wonderful free flow of the chain out. So I ha everybody has his own marks on the train and mine are very personal. I invented them myself. I'm not sure if it's the best of all worlds, but I understand them. So I have these clips in the chain and they, I use only red and blue ones actually. As long as you have your system to know how, um, uh, how deep it is. Look at that beautiful jolly parrot now coming, passing by the RYA training center. And uh, let's have some waving there. Waving back. Because here we have now three red ones, if you look there. One, two, three. This means that it is 30 meters. How deep was it? Six meters? It wouldn't go any higher. So six by five, uh, that's 30 meters. So that's exactly what we could have. We could give another uh, five meters if we wanted to. Um, but um, I think that's about what we need, really. So now we have let out our 30 meters and the chain is pointing a bit downwards. It's lying on the ground. So now we have to dig it in. So for that sake, we don't want to have the pulling force on the windlass. So I take my chain stopper. So if, I, if you remember from before, I'm now closing the chain stopper here and let out some little more chain. And now it's stopped. So the load is not anymore here. It's only on, on the chain stopper. So what we now do, we're going slowly in reverse to stretch the anchor chain. And you can have your hand here feeling if it is jumping or if it is digging in nicely um, uh, into the sand. So let's uh, look at the chain. And I give the sign to Gabi to go in reverse. So she will now go in reverse. Is she looking? Yes, that's good. So we're stretching the chain and the chain is now uh, pointing forward. And I can hold my hand here and you can feel that it is not doing any vibrations. So I give some more throttle. 
because we want to go up on uh, some 1,800 revs now. Now we can have a look at a transit line. So you can see there, for instance, you have the uh, well, what, you can take anything that you have, like the house in the foreground uh, and uh, Gibraltar uh, in the background. So the transit line should stay exactly where it does. And to make sure that it really does that, I also do it electronically. And for that sake, I'm going back into the cockpit. Here we have Gabi standing doing some 1,800 revs, I suppose. Yes, we have. What I now do is I press the man overboard button on this uh, remote control to my Furuno plotter. So I press and hold this one and now the man overboard um, is set exactly where the boat is. And uh, now we can zoom in the, uh, on the plotter and see what happens. So what I do now is I zoom in and you can see the red boat there. Uh, this is the boat and on the stern aft quarter that's where this um, red life ring was dropped that's the man overboard so that means that this is static and we are doing our 1800 revs and the boat is not moving in respect to that man overboard a little bit the boat is moving sideways to the left but that's because of the prop walk so that's great so we are uh, nice and secure dug in in wonderful sand so we can release the throttle and then switch off the engine so the anchoring is finished what uh, is missing is hoisting the anchor ball putting on the snubber and uh, setting up the anchor sail if one wanted but I'll demonstrate it because the anchor sail is really good why do I set up the anchor ball? Because many people don't. It's for an insurance purpose. Because if you are anchored in a confined space and other people are driving around and maybe crash into your boat, and uh, then the other, uh, and it's his fault of course, because I was anchored, but his insurance company, the first question he might ask is, did the other boat, that's me, have set an anchor ball? And if I hadn't, they could claim, well, it's partly my fault. How should he know that um, I was anchored? So better safe than sorry and I'll show you how easy it goes to set the anchor ball. The really practical thing is that it's all prepared to set very quickly because very many uh, sailors use the halyard and things like that to hoist it but I don't because that's far too much work. And it's prepared with this little hook and this hook goes onto the Genoa sheet and by means of this rope I'll just pull it forward and then I tie it on the push pit or on the pulpit. Look at this. So here's my snubber consisting of this chain hook and that's from uh, Mantis in the United States. It is the best chain hook I've um, come across with this security um, thing there. An over dimension shackle which is really strong because I don't trust stainless steel shackles really so that's why I over dimension this. Then two ropes, one for port and one from starboard and they all go via shock absorbers uh, Forsheda from Sweden uh, in order to stop the uh, hard movements on the anchor. Here's my Mantis chain hook and I took it onto the chain like this and secure it so we don't lose it by any means and now I can easily just let the chain go down and the chain hook fall, follows over the bow roller. Very practical. And now the board and starboard lines are going on respectively sides and are secured to the cleat because it's the cleat which should take the load. And if the chain hook doesn't work, we have the chain stopper and it should never hang onto the uh, windlass itself. Lower the chain even further and now the load is taken by the snubber instead and the chain is completely loose and it's now hanging on the port side and um, I can stretch the starboard side a little bit. In all honesty one could of course um, make a little two eyes here, splice them in there so you don't have to make a knot on the, um, on the cleats. Maybe a thing to do in the winter. Since I let down the, um, the, the chain a little bit more, I had to open the chain uh, hook, of course, or chain locker. So now I'm going to close it again. 
close it like this press the down button ready there we go so I'm down here again to set the anchor alarm by the GPS well you could sleep very well as it is because the anchor is dug in we know that it is beautiful big anchor um, it's sand so no worries but better safe than sorry so let's set an anchor alarm uh, so it wakes it up in the night if uh, the boat is dragging. There are apps on the iPhone as well, but I like to have it set on the boat. Uh, you could do it on the big plotter, but if you do it on the big plotter, it uses a lot of power. So therefore, I have a little uh, spare GPS, the Furuno GP33, and that is very uh, simple. It is an extra GPS in my network, and I use it for anchor alarm. So you can see on the plotter here where we have set the anchor. So over there you have the distance of the cursor. So if I move the cursor around here, you can see that it shows 30 meters. So uh, this is the anchor chain. So here actually, that's where the anchor is. And then we dug it in backwards towards the west. So here in the east, 30 meters, that's where the anchor is. So here's our boat in the middle. So this is my cursor. So I move it 30 meters towards the east. And 30 meters is 0 0.02 nautical miles because every 0 0.01 nautical miles is 18 meters, so twice that. So I place it here, press the go to, and that's where my anchor is. So now I can follow the boat doing a semicircle around here, swinging around the anchor, which is the green dot. And it will make me up in the night. And actually, the important thing is um, you have to set the alarm correct, but I do that only once forever, so to speak. So I press on uh, menu twice here. I press on, I go down to alarms, and you can see that my buzzer is long, and this is important, that it has to be set on anchor. So the anchor or arrival has to be set on anchor, and it gives an alarm if we are further away than 0 0.05 nautical miles. So that's it, now the anchor sail. My anchor sail is also readily available here. And it's also all prepared and very quick to set, but you should be true. So I need Gabby. Ah, there you are Gabby, that's great. So let's say it's set the um, anchor sail. It is very quick to set and everything is prepared and it's actually an anchor plow. And it wouldn't be necessary to set it in this benign condition, but I think that um, it's nice to show. And anytime it's a bit more wind, it's very, very practical. So we have a red and a green end there. That's the green end, goes on starboard side. And this is the red end, goes on port side. And I am responsible for the uh, sheet, which is this one. I have discovered that the best angle is if I pull it through uh, the kicker here, because then it gets the right angle. And then I pull it forward to that cleat over there. I have even made a little marker here there so I know the marker should be about there but that's only for me to remember still a bit loose so I should pull in that later on to stretch the uh, the sail all right so now I need the halyard so and fit it on the top there we go so here I have a little extra rope which is quite smart to pull back the head of the sail uh, towards the backstay. So I put the sail up, here it goes up, the old-fashioned way. So I can put it on the winch, yeah. and now we can pull it back a bit, there we go, and now it's at the backstay. So now we've put the, uh, the anchor sail up, we've anchored, we are safe, we can sleep, we have an anchor alarm, the snubber is there, I think it's time to start the barbecue.